I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, Genesis 42 to 50. So today's uh, block of scriptures that we're going to cover, these chapters, let's begin with kind of a, a satellite view of some of the potential symbols that we can look at as we then come down and start marching through the specific verses within these chapters. So if you look at the ancient world of the Bible, you have the Holy Land here, so there's where Jerusalem is going to be located. So this is seen as the land of Israel, the, the, the promised land for these people. And here is Egypt. So look at this, this uh, geographical lesson from this satellite view for just a moment. So you have the family of Israel living here, or Jacob, his uh, two wives, Leah and Rachel, the two concubines, Bilhah, Zilpah, and the, the twelve sons and Dinah. And the, the group is growing. They're here. They then sell Joseph into captivity and he leaves. Keep in mind, promised land is one, – one way to look at the promised land symbolically, metaphorically, would be uh, heaven for us, okay? One way to look at Egypt would be to see it as mortality or earth life. So we all leave heaven, we come down and live on the earth. In, in this mortal existence. And the beautiful part of this story is that Joseph becomes this savior uh, motif, this, this symbol for Christ who comes to the earth to prepare the way for our deliverance from bondage, from captivity, because all of the children of Israel in this story today, they're going to come down here into Egypt and in the course of time, they're going to fall into slavery. So for the first part of their sojourn in Egypt, it's all good. They're, they're not in bondage, kind of like us. When we're born into mortality, you get eight years where you're not accountable. It's good. But then we all, who live to that age of accountability, fall into the, the realm of sin and using our agency inappropriately, and we, we end up in bondage or captivity to sin, and we're all going to die. So it's this beautiful metaphor of Joseph. It's in his captivity. It's in his bonds his, as a servant, as a suffering servant, that he actually breaks those bands of death and hell to open the way for our deliverance to then be taken out of captivity and eventually brought back into the promised land of heaven. And we'll get all of this story of the Exodus uh, and numbers and the, the stories that take place for 40 years as they're out here, all with beautiful metaphorical tie-ins to this big picture plan of salvation of us trying to find our way on the covenant path back into the presence of God in this symbolic promised land. Uh, and the amazing thing is, is we get to experience this journey in a metaphorical way every time we go to the temple of our God. This idea of leaving the world behind and learning the path that we walk back into the presence of God, symbolized by the celestial room, or in the scriptural context, the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. And we'll, we'll talk a lot more about this in subsequent weeks coming up. But I just – we wanted to lay this out initially as a, as a lens, one of many lenses – it's not the only way to read these verses and these chapters – but it's one that you can look for additional ways that it ties into your story and our, our journey along the covenant path so that it doesn't what, – what we're trying to avoid is turning our scripture study into exclusively just a history lesson about a, a group of people who lived thousands of miles away, thousands of years in the past, and we become uh, knowledgeable about what happened to them, but 
that's it. We just know names, dates, facts, figures, but it it doesn't have any relevance or connection or applicability to us. And we're, we're trying to avoid that because we, we want to follow Nephi's injunction of likening all scriptures unto us. So an important way that the Bible writers wanted to signal lessons for us to pay attention to, among the many lessons, is to know the meanings of names. And we're now in the middle of the Joseph story, starts in Genesis 37, it concludes in Genesis 50, and we didn't mention this in the last lesson, but Joseph's name in Hebrew means to add or to increase. I might add a word here uh, to, to multiply. And if you look for that theme of how does God increase the prosperity or add to somebody who has been faithful to him. Now, last lesson, we talked about how Joseph was increased or added to, and we'll see the same thing happens throughout the story that eventually we'll see how all the tribes of Israel, because of Joseph's sticking with God and being faithful to God, he's able to increase everybody. And eventually, when we get into the Exodus story, the Israelites have increased so much that the Egyptians are worried about it and uh, enslave the Israelites. So that's just another theme you can look for in the story is how God increases the faithful. He increases everything that's good in their lives if they're faithful to him. It's beautiful. So as you begin chapter 42, we're up in the land of Canaan, and verse 1 begins with uh, is saying, now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, why do you look one upon another? Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get ye down hither, thither, and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. Now, again, we've said this before, we'll say it again, there's no analogy in the scriptures that's perfect, that fits every single aspect of whatever it is that it's symbolizing for you. And so you, you have to be careful when you get into this uh, uh, comparing symbols to real uh, doctrines or real historical events. In this context, there's a part of this story that you could connect, but another part that, that would make no sense at all to our pre-mortal life. It's almost as if you could say, hmm, this is interesting. Is it possible you could look at us living in the presence of our heavenly parents before we were born? We had progressed to a certain point, and now if we wanted to continue to grow and progress, we were going to have to leave the promised land, have to leave heaven. This, this land that has been promised to all of us, if we'll, if we'll stay faithful, isn't it ironic that in order to attain it forever, we would have to leave for a season and go down to a symbolic Egypt to be able to continue our growth and our progression? So, ten of the brothers, the ten oldest brothers, left to go down to Egypt. Now, let's do some really quick calculations here for a minute. We know, what, what do we know about Benjamin, the twelfth child, the, the younger brother of Joseph from his mother uh, Rachel? So we know that Rachel died in childbirth, give, giving birth to Benjamin, and she is buried near Bethlehem and this was on their, their journey back home, down towards Beersheba. And so then, sometime shortly after that, we don't know how many exact years, Joseph is then sold into Egypt, and then you, he, he was 17 when you get that whole story with the, the coat of many colors, and then him getting sold into Egypt, and then 13 years later is when he gives the, the prophecy to to Pharaoh about seven years of plenty, so we can start doing some math here. So he's roughly 37 years old, and Joseph is the 11th child, which puts all of his brothers older, and it puts Benjamin some, something younger than 37. But it's been so long since Joseph was with them, he asks a question you're going to find later on when they actually bring Benjamin down, is this your younger, youngest brother? Because it's possible that the last time Joseph saw his brother Benjamin was when he was a, uh, either an infant or a, a small child, and in these subsequent 20 years, it, he, Joseph may not have any idea what his, what his full brother 
would have looked like for sure. And so there's this uncertainty, but it's this excitement that Joseph senses when, when these brothers show up and he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Uh, it, hmm, that makes me wonder, were there times in the life of Christ where he recognized things in people that he interacted with, but they had no idea who they were talking to. They had no clue who Jesus really was, but he knew them. So, let's jump into this first journey down with ten of the brothers, obviously leaving Benjamin home because Jacob doesn't want to lose him as well. Uh, Israel is very concerned. In fact, he he says in verse 4, but Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. Now, I wonder why he would, why he would be concerned that mischief should befall Benjamin. It makes you wonder if, if he's so concerned because of what happened to Joseph in the past. He says, I, I'm not losing Benjamin as well. So they come to buy the corn, and notice Verse 6, Joseph was the governor over the land, and it was, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. At this point, Joseph's reaction is, is to look at them and remember something. Verse 8, Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies. To see the nakedness of the land, ye are come. You can, you can see right, right in this moment, it's almost like this plan formulating in Joseph's mind of, I wonder, I wonder if they've changed at all, or if they're exactly the same as they were dealing with me 20 years ago. Uh, back when, when they sold me into captivity. Have, have, have they changed at all? And so he sets up this, this little test for them um, where he, he puts all of them in prison for three days and he tells them, after he's asked them about their, their family history and they've told him, look, we're, we're 12 sons, but we've got a younger brother at home and one is not anymore, which tells you, uh, at the bottom of verse 13, one is not, implies that in their mind, Joseph's dead, and so they're, they're telling the truth, and Joseph hears that and he puts them all in prison, then after three days he says, okay, here's how you're going to prove that you're not spies. I'm going to keep one of you behind and uh, the rest of you are going to go and get your younger, youngest brother and come back down and, and show me that you're really telling me the truth here. Notice what happens next, verse 21. They said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. So they're sitting there talking in their in their probably Hebrew tongue, Joseph has been speaking to them through an interpreter, so they have no idea that he's understanding everything they're saying, and they're saying, this is happening to us because of what we did to Joseph. We, we should have known better. At which point Reuben steps forward in verse 22, and he said, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Reuben's saying, I told you guys not to do this, and when I left to do something, you, you went and sold him. This is bad. That's a part of the story that perhaps Joseph hadn't been aware of before. Fascinating, looking at verse uh, 23, it says, and they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter, and he turned himself about from them and wept, and returned to them again and commanded them, or, or communed with them, and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. We, we don't it's know why him, but this is my speculation. We know Simeon actually was a bit of a hothead. He and his brother Levi actually went and massacred a town full of men. My speculation is that Simeon may have been kind of the ringleader 
in his hot headedness to want to hurt Joseph. Oh, look, the other brothers really didn't like Joseph, but he may have been the ringleader. And so Joseph is like, well, let's actually have you sit in prison for a couple months. We'll keep Simeon back here, which is interesting because Simeon is your second son. So Reuben's the oldest. He, he should have been the one in charge. And so Simeon, after Reuben had left that conversation back in the, the story from 20 years ago, Simeon should have been the one to step up and defend him, and he, he isn't. So we don't know because the scripture doesn't give us the answer. The, the fact is Simeon is the second son. He's the one that Joseph handpicks to say, keep him behind in prison. The rest of you go home and get that brother and come back and prove that you're not spies. You'll notice that Joseph has them uh, sent home with the sacks of grain, but then to put all of their money back in the sacks. So all of the money is returned, and as they're going along, they discover that some of the money's there, and then as they all get home, they recognize, whoa, all of the money has been returned, and we have the grain, and it troubles them. And they tell this story to their father when, when they've come home, and it makes Israel pretty upset. He, he's pretty frustrated that they have divulged this information that he has this other son, Benjamin, and he's, he's not about to send them back right then. And I find it fascinating, the, the rationale that, that happens here at the very end of chapter 42, because Reuben comes to his dad and says, look, we, we have got to go back and prove that we've got this youngest brother, Benjamin, so tell you what, if we take Benjamin and something bad happens to him, then dad, you can, you can kill my two sons, verse 37 and 38. That's, I, I don't know about you, but from our 21st century perspective, that's bizarre. And to actually make it clear, it would have been unlikely for anyone to actually have acted on that. This is a way of actually impressing upon the mind of how serious Reuben was about committing to something. We've used this word before. If you've ever signed a mortgage, a mortgage, it's called a death pledge in, in Latin, that you're signing your life away, technically. But nobody dies if they don't you know, pay their mortgage. Bad things happen, like bankruptcy. And so what, what Reuben's really trying to do here is convince his dad, you can trust us, and I'm so serious about fulfilling my obligation, you can kill my two sons. It's really more of an exaggeration. That's just not how we do things today, and that might give us a bit of explanation for why Reuben would say something that sounds quite rash. So, you turn over to chapter 43, and obviously since he didn't immediately send the boys back to Egypt to, to free Simeon and to clear their name and their story, chapter 43 begins, And the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass that when they had eaten up the corn which had been brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. Uh, we're going to die. So it's, it's kind of that that critical decision point for Jacob where he says, well, I'm worried about my son Benjamin's safety, but if we don't send somebody down to get some food, then we're all going to die. It's, it's not worth trying to save his life by losing everybody's life in the process. So, you'll notice that Judah steps forward. Remember, Judah is the brother that came up with the idea to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. Uh, to send him down into Egyptian slavery. Now it's Judah that steps forward. You've, you've probably remembered from previous lessons some of the struggles that Judah's had in the past. We might say that the Bible is full of what we would say examples and non-examples, and it's helpful to see both so you know what this dark contrast is. Yeah. And Judah's life now seems to be an example. Now, yeah, so, so now this watch, point. watch this shift so that we don't hold Judah hostage to his past and to the, to the poor decisions that he's made. Look at what he does here and look at what a, a symbolic type of Christ he becomes in, in this intercessor, mediator kind of a role. So, so listen to some of these words. Verse 8, and Judah said unto Israel his father, keeping in mind, by the way, that Judah is the tribe into which Jesus Christ is going to be born, Mary being in the tribe of Judah as a descendant of, of this man here. 
So Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. He's saying, I am going to take personal responsibility for Benjamin, and he will not die. I'm, I, I will give my life to preserve him and to keep him safe. Um, look down at verse, in verse 9, he continues, I will be surety for him, of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. This, this Christ-like owning of, of the situation is profound. I put it on me. I'll take the full weight and the full responsibility for his life. Well, that's what Jesus did for every single one of us, is he, he takes everything upon himself and gives his assurance to the Father that he is going to walk this path with us. It's a, it's a beautiful analogy. So, Father Israel says, okay, well, we're going to take that money that was returned and take new money, so we're going to take double the money and take a little present for this, this Egyptian lord, um, and he tells them what to give him in verse 11, and he sends them on their way. So now they come into Egypt, ten of them yet again, because remember, Simeon's in jail, um, and there's Joseph already there, and now Benjamin comes with his nine brothers on that second journey. And and by the way, this is where sometimes symbolism is is fun because it's 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 so variable. You can look at it from so many different angles. In this case, when you think of Jesus coming to the earth for the first time, most people not recognizing him, and then coming to the earth the second time for his second coming, now every knee is going to end up bowing down and every mouth is going to end up confessing, yep, that's him. In this case, it's not Joseph who's coming to them, it's them coming to Joseph the second time, and it's here where it's all going to be revealed. So, you get this story where they come in and he tells his, his Egyptian guards, bring them to my house, go and, and prepare a nice lunch for them, they're going to eat in my house with us today at noon. So, stop and think about that for a minute. I wonder, I wonder if there might be some potential symbols that could teach us about coming into the house of, in this case, Joseph, but in the symbolic realm, into the house of the Lord, where he's preparing a feast for us, where he's going to reveal some things to us, where we're going to hear some things that we didn't understand before, and, and our mind is going to be opened up to relationships that exist that, that we're not uh, aware of when we enter the house. It's, to me, this is a beautiful symbolic uh, temple text on, on one level. Now, again, every analogy breaks down eventually, so don't, don't read too much into that, but notice verse 23, they're, they're a little concerned about coming into his house, and he said, peace be to you, fear not, your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money, and he brought Simeon out unto them. So there was that concern of, oh no, did he bring us here because he's, he's really going to punish us and make us pay for what we did, and now he's going to think we stole this money, and uh, are, are we in big trouble? And I love that idea of peace be to you, fear not. That is the message of Jesus Christ when we come to him with meekness and humility. It's not, it's not one of, I'm going to get some things out of you, because quite frankly, there's nothing that I own that I can give to the Lord Jesus Christ that would make him richer. That it, everything I have is already in his hands. He holds the universe in his hand. It's, it's really my heart, my devotion, my agency that he wants me to be able to lay of my own free will and choice at his feet. And you, you see some of that element coming through here. Let's play on this a bit more. 
let's tie this back into the sacrament. We've mentioned in the past, in the ancient Middle East, if there was a meal going on, you were invited to that meal, it meant that you were in a state of peace with the person providing the meal. So Joseph is actually signaling to his brothers, both in deed and in word, he says, fear not, peace unto you, that this is a peace offering. When you come to the table to eat, it means we're at a state of peace. So think about this. When you go to the sacrament table, you are at a state of peace with God. Even if there had been conflict in the past, even if you guys have been at odds, we all get at odds with God at some point in our lives. We come to the table, he's invited us to the sacrament table, and he's offering us the emblems of peace, which is his body. And notice that there's a present brought by the brothers. They don't come empty-handed. When we go to the sacrament table, we actually sacrifice our sins at the altar there, right? We basically say, Lord, I am working to give up my fallen nature. Here is my present to you. Um, and notice that all the things that they bring, all this wealth, is actually wealth that they got right back from Joseph. God does the same thing. We bring him our very best, and he adds to it or increases what we have. In fact, the word Joseph, as we mentioned before, means to increase. So when you go to the sacrament table, the point there is for you to experience peace with God and for him to increase the good in your life. And that's, I think, what we have going on here. Yeah. So he, he asks them after they've brought their gift, in verse 27, he asks them of their welfare, and he then asks, is your father well? The, the old man of whom you speak, is he yet alive? Because it's, it's been a while since he's last seen them. And they respond, yes, he's in, in good health, he's yet alive. And then in verse 29, he saw Benjamin, his, his brother, his mother's son. And he said, is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? Uh, it, makes you, it makes you wonder the, that feeling that Joseph is feeling as he looks at this, this brother of his that he hasn't seen for 20 years. Again, we don't know how old Benjamin was when Joseph was sold, but either way, 20 years for, for uh, Benjamin would have made a big difference in how he looks. And so they say, yeah, this is him, and he has to make haste in verse 30 to get out, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. He's moved with so much love and, and joy at seeing his brother again that he had to go and cry. He washed his face, then he went out, and he said, set on bread. And then 32 is interesting. It's this little commentary where it tells you that uh, they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves, and for the Egyptians, which did eat with him by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. You'll notice that little line, that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. What Taylor's been talking about, this idea in the ancient world, this concept of table fellowship is a far bigger deal than it is to us today. You know, if you sit down and eat a meal with somebody, it's like, big deal. To them, it is a big deal, and it's fascinating because 400 years later, with the Law of Moses, they're going to get some of these same ideas embedded into their, their Law of Moses, where now, if you're in the House of Israel, you actually can become defiled, you can become unclean and, and ritually impure if you have table fellowship with a Gentile, with somebody who's not of the house of Israel. Well, we see this in reverse here at this experience where this is the way they're being treated is, pfft, it's an abomination to eat with you people. Now keep in mind, later on in this story we're going to find out that when, when Jacob and his family come down into Egypt, Joseph's going to warn them. He's going to say, ah, just so you know, when the Pharaoh asks you what your occupation is, you're going to tell them you're shepherds? That thing is an abomination to the Egyptians. And most people reading that today would go, well, what's wrong with that? What, why is that an abomination to be a shepherd? Keep in mind, we don't have all of the pieces to this puzzle, but what we do understand is that for the Egyptians, especially for, for like cattle, they see cows 
very differently. What, what did the children of Israel do after 400 years of slavery and they get brought out of Egyptian slavery out into the wilderness and they think Moses is gone? They build an idol, and what is the idol? It's a golden calf, and they worship the calf. And so can you see how that's one possible way that they could say, ooh, it's an abomination to eat with you, with you Hebrews because you eat meat of which we see as being sacred and holy. There may also be cultural things going on here. Egypt at this point is like the most powerful, prosperous, civilized location anywhere on planet Earth. It's, I mean, at the height of like human prosperity and civilization. And shepherds are these uncouth, unwashed, dirty vagabonds. And it's interesting how human nature doesn't change much. We love to create tribes. We do it with sports or politics, and we even do it with how we treat people from sometimes different countries, or different cultures, saying, well, if they're from that culture or that country, well, then they're less than me, and I don't want to be around them because I will look bad. My personal brand will be impacted if I'm associated with somebody who, I don't know, grew up in some other culture. And this has been going on for centuries and millennia of humans dividing themselves based on how God has blessed them with different resources. And some people say, I have all these resources. I got them all by myself. They don't claim that God gave them to them. And therefore, other people are not worthy to be with me. And it's interesting, in the New Testament, God actually has to teach Peter, who culturally is this Jew, where this has been going on for years among the Israelites and the Jews, to like not want to be around Gentiles. God has to give him this revelation, like, look, it is okay to hang out with people who did not weren't born into the house of Israel. They're part of my children too, and you need to welcome them in at the table of fellowship. Beautiful. Now, the, the fun part of this story, can, can you imagine what it would be like for these brothers? The, now you have 11 of the brothers who are there with Joseph. So the, the, every one of, of Jacob's sons are here in this room at this point, and Joseph seats them at the table in their birth order without asking them any questions. Let's have you sit here, and that's Reuben, Reuben, and then Simeon, and then Levi, and then Judah, and then Dan, and then Naphtali, and then Gad, and then Asher, and then Issachar, and then Zebulun, and then Benjamin. Can you picture these brothers looking at each other going, whoa, how, how, did, how did he do that? That's, that's amazing. And then to make the test complete, well, we're not complete yet, but one more step in Joseph's test for his brothers to see if they've changed. He sends out the food to each of these brothers, and then the food given to Benjamin is five times the volume. And he's watching. How are they going to respond? Are they still jealous of their younger brother, like they were of me? Are they going to treat him with disdain and disrespect? And gratefully, they pass this test. So as he, as he then sends them away with grain and all of the money back in their sacks again and his silver divining cup, actually, in the, the sack of Benjamin, sends them away, lets them get a little bit of a head start and then sends his guards after them. They catch up to them and say, hey, one of you, one of you stole this cup. And notice what they said. In verse 9, with whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondsmen. That's how confident they are that none of them stole this cup. Whoever, whoever took it, kill him. Little do they know. It's important to note here, if you've had kids or seen how kids act and they get into a stressful situation, how often do kids make really exaggerated claims of confidence? So we get this in the Bible sometimes, that people make rash vows or rash claims before they really have all the evidence in. And again, it's not that they're really going to go murder somebody. It's just a very powerful way to say 100 percent, a, a thousand percent, they are over-exaggerating their confidence. And, <laughs> and, and can you imagine that confidence as they're sitting there saying, we for sure don't have it. Verse 12, and he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest. So you can picture as he works his way down the line of the brothers from oldest to youngest, yep, not here, not here, not here, we knew it, we knew it, we knew it. And they come to Benjamin's sack and open it, and the cup was found. 
in Benjamin's sack. Now can you picture the look on their face? Can you picture the feeling in their heart and the, the looks that they're going to give each other at this point? As we go back to Joseph's house, and they all fell before him on the ground, and he asks them, what, what did you do? After all that I did for you, why did you do this? And they say, look, we'll, uh, verse 16, Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak, or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. He's saying, Judah is owning something here. It's, it's this pseudo-confessional to Joseph. He's saying, this is actually in punishment for something we did for our other brother 20 years ago. God's bringing it back to us. Uh, that had to warm Joseph's heart a little bit to see that they're, they're actually fessing up, they're owning that past transgression. And Joseph's response to them is very simple. God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant, and as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. The rest of you go home. I'm keeping Benjamin here as my servant. He's just tightening the screws and just really, he, Joseph knows where the pain point is, the pressure point. He's just pushing on it to really see, have these men become better through their suffering that they won't break like they did in the past. And, and here you go, verse 18, Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. Which means this is a private conversation between the two, two of, of you. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. And then he goes and he tells his long story in verse 19 all the way down through, through 34. And he's basically saying, if we go home without Benjamin, then our dad will be brought down to the grave. He, he, he will not survive this news. This is the worst possible scenario. I'm not sure how it happened. We brought him down here on, on, in good faith that we would bring him home to our father, and we're very, very concerned. So do anything you want to me or any of my brothers, but just let Benjamin go home. Well, chapter 45 opens with verse 1, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried. Can you picture this? He's sitting there in front of all of these men, and they have no idea who he is, and he starts crying, and he tells the servants, Cause every man to go out from me, and there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So it's just the family now. Verse 2, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. This is some, this is some weeping that he's going through. And then verse 3, Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? Now keep in mind, if he sent everybody away, he's been using an interpreter this whole time. But now everybody's gone. It's just him and his brothers. So now he speaks in his, his native tongue with them, we would assume, and he says, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. I guess this speechless moment of, wait, what? What did you just say? You, you just spoke our language. Who are you? Major plot twist. And... He goes on to say, verse 4, Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Brothers and sisters, I, I think that for all of us, there will be a day when we get to come into the presence of the Savior, Jesus Christ, um, for all of us in the next life, where won't that be an amazing thing when all things are revealed, where we get to see past, present, future, all things revealed and recognize him for whom he really is and who he was in our life and how he saved us, even though we maybe didn't acknowledge his hand or recognize who it was that was saving us at those various points. I think there's a, a beautiful connection here to us in that 
it's not just being able to hear him, it's being able to see him as well everywhere we look. It was Mother Teresa who said that when asked how she was able to do such difficult work with the very poorest of the poor of the poor in her life, I think her response was something like, I look for the face of God in every person I meet. It's that idea of looking for the reflection of God in all of those interactions that she has and recognizing his his countenance reflected there, and it gives you power to serve and to do good, especially doing good to those who have despitefully used you or persecuted you in the past in this context. I love what Joseph does next. Immediately he says, and this is the power of forgiveness, because he's had a long time to think about, how do I not let the pain that my brothers did to me kill me? How do I let God's atonement heal me of pain other people have caused me? And you can see he's been healed by the atonement. Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. What a message. How many of us in our lives have been hurt by others? And if we could take the time to say, what is God working out? What salvation is he causing to happen? Given circumstances that I haven't chosen for myself or didn't want for myself or didn't plan for myself, how can God turn this to good? And in my life, I have seen, I have seen in my life and other people's lives that we let God work things out. We can see that he can turn anything to good if we're patient and trusting. Yeah, you know, the the human tendency here would be for Joseph to to call back those guards in now that it's all revealed and say, okay, here's here's Simeon and Levi who were kind of aggressive. I want you to, to, to do such and such to them. And here's Judah. You're the one who sold me. I want you to do such and such to them. You'll notice human tendency is to get revenge, but Christ-like tendency is to give grace, to extend forgiveness and mercy when, especially in, the, in these contexts where the people, they've, they've changed their hearts, they're shifted. So I love the fact that Joseph is not punishing his brothers in this moment because it would be like holding his current brothers hostage to the twenty-year past version of themselves. There's something really, really uh, symbolically beautiful and Christ-like here when you get verse 15. After all those beautiful verses there at the beginning of chapter 45 of redemption, of forgiveness, of grace, of mercy, it culminates in verse 15, moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them, and after that his brethren talked with him. It's this reconciliation, this this atonement uh, motif that's taking place here. Now, there are many who, who might be watching this who, who might feel like, but I would desperately love for this to happen with me and the Lord, but I'm a bad person, or I haven't been as good as I should have been or could have been. I, I hope that as you study these chapters, you, you go to heaven in prayer and in, in meditation and in pondering to ask God how God feels about you or if God is willing to forgive you and take you into his arms of mercy, into that sweet embrace of, of grace, an embrace of grace where you, you get kissed by God and where he gives you opportunities to move forward in progression and in faith rather than look back in regret and in remorse and in fear of punishment and, and retribution from the angels in heaven. So once all of this is revealed, the brothers are then told to go back home and share all the good news with dad and bring him down hither. So in verse 26 it says, and they told him, that's Jacob their father, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. 
And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived." Uh, it's, it's that beautiful reawakening of when you come to know truth, when you see things clearly, something wakens in, uh, awakens inside of us. It's a new life that Jacob is given where he, he seems to be on his way to the grave here, but he's going to get a new lease on life. He's going to go down into Egypt and we're going to get many, many more years with Father Jacob before he actually does pass away at the end of our story here. Now, as Jacob gets ready to leave Canaan and go down into Egypt, I love the fact that he doesn't just hear the good news and then jump in the, the wagons and head down. He does something first, and uh, it's something that we as mortals often overlook. Look at verse 1. Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. So he, he comes to that special sacred place that is, is highly significant to this family. And probably not on the path to Egypt. Correct. It's actually a diversion. And, and he first makes an offering, a sacrifice to God. It's a thank offering here. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. So you get this prophecy given to Jacob. And verse 4, I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. It's this idea of you are not going down into Egypt alone. I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm not going to leave you in Egypt. I'm going to bring you back out of Egypt again someday. So just like I'm going with you in, I'm going to go with you out and bring your posterity eventually back into the Promised Land. So that frees up Jacob or Israel to just find great joy in his journey down to Egypt knowing that it's not the end destination. It's a means to the end that God has provided for him. And there's things that are left unsaid here because the Bible authors just are living in their culture. They understand that in the ancient world, people thought or conceived of their gods as being national gods only over a certain territory. And so you wouldn't actually imagine one god actually uh, moving from one territory to another because that's an invasion. And here's God saying, yes, I am the god of the la promised land, but I am actually your god wherever you go. And this is highly unusual in the ancient world. If you're out traveling, like say you're a Babylonian and you're going to go travel to Syria, you're going to worship your gods of Babylon and hope that they can prosper you along the way, but you would probably get to Syria and find some other gods you want to worship so they can take care of you while you're there. That was how people saw it. So this is really, really significant in Jake's, Jacob's perspective. He's like, I have a God who's not simply just the God of this promised land, but he is the God of wherever I'm at in my life. And I think about this really powerful word we have in the Book of Mormon about how God knows how to succor us. And the word succor literally means to run underneath. And God is like this. He's like, Jacob, wherever you go, I am there for you. I am running underneath you. You will not only find me if you happen to be in this special land that I've set aside. Wherever I send you, I am there. That's just a beautiful promise. And it's true for all of us. God is the God of the whole world, not just of the uh, certain geographical boundaries here on earth. Yeah, you know, if we're, if we're willing to completely acknowledge to God, we actually want to be thy people. I want to be thy son. I don't want, I don't want other things of this world to be my God. If, if we can get ourselves to that point, regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of what we might be wrestling with or struggling through or the opposition and trials we might be facing, if we can keep going to him and saying, I want you to be my God, I want to be thy people, I want to serve thee, what can I do? Then 
we can get that exact same promise given to Jacob for us, and it just stays wherever we go. I love that. I love that principle. So now they arrive, and you'll notice it's at the end of chapter 46, there in, in the bottom of verse 34, where, where Jacob informs, or sorry, Joseph informs his father, Jacob, and his brothers, you know, we're coming in here, and Pharaoh's going to let us come in, but every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians, just so you know, and for various reasons. So they come in, Pharaoh welcomes them, gives them the finest land there in Goshen, and then but by the way, the word Goshen is showing up in the like Jershon. It's a, this Hebrew word that literally means inheritance. So um, it's it's called the land of inheritance, and that's where they the yeah. land they get in Egypt. So that's the equivalent is going to show up in that Book of Mormon with the anti Nephi Lehite group of people who get the land of Jershon, uh, an inheritance, a gift. Now, the the famine gets worse to the point where even though they had stored up seven years of plenty those stores are starting to run dry at the individual level. So you'll notice in chapter 47 how Joseph keeps asking for increasingly more sacrifices from the people in order to get the grain they need to make bread and, and to survive this famine. So in verse 14, it starts with all of their money, and then in verse 17, the famine hasn't gone away and they still need more grain, so they now trade for the grain with their cattle in verse 17. So they're, they're giving some of the, the living things that they own until those are all done. And then in verse 20, Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field. So they're giving up now the land on which they live in order to, to survive. And then ultimately, verse 23, Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow in the land. So it's as if the famine has ended because you're now taking the seed and you're going to sow it in the land. You wouldn't sow that if you're still in the, the years of famine or it would just be throwing your seeds away. So he, his ultimate sacrifice that he asks them to give is of themselves. Isn't that interesting to note that he begins with asking them for their money, and then their cattle, the, the living things that they possess, and then their land, and then finally themselves. Uh, it's, to me, this is a, a fascinating list to look at and consider that when the God of heaven says, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people, he's not just asking for us to, to give an occasional thought to him by saying a prayer or two or reading a scripture or going to a church meeting every once in a while and then not thinking about him at any other time. The God of the universe is actually asking for us to give us, to give him everything that we have, to put it all on the altar. We call that consecration. It's to hold nothing back. It's not ever to say, well, the land that I purchased, the home that I live in, that's mine. I earned it. I deserve that. I paid for it with my money. The, the point of consecration and saying, I want thee to be my God and I want to be thy people, is to say, Lord, you own all of this. My van, my car, they're not mine, they're thine. My home, my land, any, any animals or any money I have, it's all thine. And ultimately, the hardest thing and the last thing that they gave was themselves. That's where we try to get in the gospel of Jesus Christ is to this point where we no longer wake up in the morning and say, what's in it for me? God, what can you do for me? But rather when we wake up in the morning and say, Father, here am I, send me, I'll be thy son, because Jesus taught us how to use that phrase appropriately and how to consecrate our life. And, and it doesn't mean that we ignore all of the things of the, the earth, like earning money and providing for a family or taking care of things that God has given us or, or buying house or home or land. It's that those things become a means to an end 
rather than an end in and of themselves, which is how the world sees them in which we live. So now you're, you're in Egypt. Jacob is ready to die. He, he's been there many years, and he's, he knows that the end is near. Joseph hears about that and brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to his father's room, at which point uh, Father Israel wakes up and he tells Joseph, bring your two sons to me. Now, keep in mind, the birthright son gets a double portion blessing from, from the father. So, one of the ways that Jacob fulfills this double portion is to say, Joseph, bring your two sons. I am going to adopt them. They are going to become my sons. So, now you technically have 13 tribes of Israel because we, we drop the, the, the notion of the tribe of Joseph, and in his place we get the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh. The baker's dozen. It is, 13. And so, Joseph intentionally puts Manasseh at his father's right knee, the oldest, because the right hand is the birth right hand, and Ephraim at the left knee, at which point blind Jacob crosses his hands, and you'll notice Joseph interrupts him, picks up, physically picks up his dad's hands. It's actually a little bothered, too. And yeah, he's a dad. This is, this is the firstborn, Manasseh. He's over here on the right-hand side. Um, look at verse 19. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he shall also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh, and he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And so he then continues with the blessing. It's this idea that in the latter days, the responsibility for gathering all of the house of Israel again is going to fall on the head of Ephraim, and Manasseh is going to be right beside him in that effort. All of the tribes of Israel are going to be looking in the latter days to these two for the gathering effort into the, this covenant connection with God. And now, here we sit in the 21st century uh, trying to fulfill these prophecies and these, these visions that have been had by these p prophets and patriarchs and matriarchs of old. Now, these are our days. So, many, many people who have been baptized in the church have either been a part of or adopted into the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh and others. They're, they're, they're all represented in people who have been baptized, and every tribe has a role to fulfill, uh, but Ephraim is the one responsible for making sure that this work takes place and spreads forth across all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples of the earth, and gratefully Manasseh is that they're working side by side to, to bring about this great gathering effort. Now, in chapter 49, you get the additional, uh, what have been often referred to as the patriarchal blessings of the other 11 tribes. So, we, we already got Ephraim and Manasseh being blessed there. Now you get Reuben in verse 3, then you get a joint blessing to Simeon and Levi. These two brothers seem inseparable in the story, verse 5, and then Judah in verse 8, fascinating that Judah gets such a long blessing compared to most of the other brothers. Um, it's Judah and Joseph that get the, the longer blessings. Uh, look at verse 10 in, within Judah's blessing. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. It's this, this beautiful promise of Shiloh, the, the person through whom, whose right it is to gather everybody, it's going to come through Judah, and he's going to have this power to, to um, be a lawgiver. You'll notice some of our, our most famous kings in the, in the biblical story coming up in future lessons, King David, King Solomon, and they, they are from the tribe of Judah. 
and the prophecies among all the, the Jews, their, their expectations for a Messiah to come, they're told it will be a son of David who will be the lion of the tribe of Judah who's going to come and, and restore the kingdom to Israel someday. Then you get these other brothers listed, verse 13, Zebulon, 14, Issachar, 16, Dan, 19, Gad, 20, Asher, 21, Naphtali, and then 22, you get Joseph, who is told he's a fruitful bough by a wall, or by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The way that the Book of Mormon prophets read this is they say, see, this is us, so they're interpreting this patriarchal blessing saying, we're the part of Joseph that grew over the wall. We're, we're on the other side of the world, but we're fully of the tribe of, of Joseph through Lehi. We know his, his uh, genealogy comes through Manasseh. And then in verse 33, right at the very end, Father Jacob, the great patriarch Israel, he gave up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. And Joseph keeps the promise that he made to his dad, that he wouldn't bury him in Egypt. So he has his body embalmed, and then they take a whole group in chapter 50 up to the, to the burial place um, where his grandfather and father and Leah, his wife, is buried. Rachel isn't there because she had died near Bethlehem, further north. And so look at verse... Uh, 15. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly require us all the evil which we did unto him. They're like, oh no, we're in trouble now. And I love the fact that Joseph, as he comes to them, verse 19, he says, fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. I think at the end of all things, Jesus Christ, the great creator, the great atoner, and the great judge, could say the exact same thing to all of us collectively, to say, don't sit there in fear waiting for me to smite you down. All those bad things that, that humans did to me on the earth, that that brought about a means whereby redemption and atonement could be made to save you so that we could extend this mercy to you. We don't need to live our life in fear of an angry God who's just waiting to smite us down, but rather in love and appreciation for a God who actually cares enough about you to say, I'm giving you the gift of my son to save you. Will you please accept this gift? And the way you accept it is have faith in him, repent of your sins, get baptized into this covenantal connection, receive that gift of the Holy Ghost, and then endure in faith through all of the experiences of life that are going to come your way. And then we don't need to be afraid. We can just be filled with gratitude and love. God empowers us, and I love that this story was preserved in the Bible to teach us that God's mercy is far beyond comprehension. We are a bit like Joseph's brothers, that we worry at times, is God going to smite us? Is God going to be angry? And what does he say? Fear not. Be at peace. I'm here to nourish you. And so let us receive with gladness, with open hands, the nourishing that God wants to provide for us. And as we do that, we will see salvation being unfolded in our lives and fear will diminish. May the Lord bless all of us to more fully turn heavenward and say, we want thee to be our God and we want to be thy people. That's our prayer. And we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. Yeah.